Today we're going to take a closer look at what's inside an RC jet. Now the first thing is with RC jets is they're actually a lot simpler than you think. And it actually blew my mind how simple they actually are and how refined they are compared to even a, uh, setting up a gas plane uh, or an electric plane. Electric planes are pretty simple, but a turbine's probably about the same. It's really not that complex. I'm gonna start from the turbine and then move forward. Now, a turbine motor nowadays is as simple as the turbine unit itself and one cable that plugs into it. Yes, you have your fuel lines that have to go into the turbine as well, but besides your fuel line, you've got one cable to control that turbine and all the electronics, thanks to great computing power. So the turbine's really a non-event. It's so easy to install a turbine into a jet. You know, when we build those gas planes, we've got to get a template and drill the, uh, the mounting uh, bolts and things like that and put them in the right area to get your cow gaps and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's none of that. Literally around four bolts is all that is needed to clamp a turbine in. So replacing a turbine motor or pulling it out for maintenance is easier than anything else. But all jets really have an access hatch to the turbine uh, with this Viper jet it's underneath, but it's really, really simple. So it's just a non-event. One cable going straight into, in this case, it's a JetCat P100RX. It's just one cable going straight in. Moving forward from the turbine, the turbine is controlled by the ECU. It's a bit like a car when we have a computer in a car. Now it's down here uh, and it's supplied with the turbine, so it's, it's, it's a match. And as I said, there's one cable that comes out from the ECU that goes into the, uh, into the turbine. But the ECU is a really smart piece of kit. Like it's managing everything from the startup of the turbine, the shutdown, of course, the operation of it, fuel flows and things like that. So it, it's not only connected to the turbine, but it's also connected to other components within the jet. So what are some of those components? Well, the first thing that I want to talk about is the pump. The pump uh, provides the fuel to the turbine. Now, that flow rate and all that kind of stuff is triggered by the ECU. You know, with the startup sequence, all that kind of stuff. It's controlling the pump uh, to make sure there's fuel pumping into that turbine at the right rate. The ECU is also needs to be powered. So there's a battery, there's a designated battery just connected to the ECU. In most instances, it's a life pack running at around 6.6 .6 volts that connects directly into the ECU to power the electronics that are associated with the turbine. But keeping it really, really simple, you've got an ECU going to a pump, uh, going to the motor, a battery coming in, and then of course, a connection between the ECU and your receiver for your throttle position. Receiver in for your throttle, you've got out to uh, the pump, you've got out to the motor, and then you've got a battery line in, and that's about it. Thanks to that ECU, everything is sort of managed. There's no configuration required. It's almost plug and play kind of setup. And one of the things you need to do with uh, the ECU is you do need to program the ECU. Now, you are given a handheld unit. Here's the handheld unit. So this plugs into the ECU. There's a port to, like a data port that you can plug in. Uh, and it will give you all the readings that the ECU is seeing, so RPM and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I use this device to help set the throttle position. So you know when we go and fly electric planes, sometimes we need to adjust the minimum and maximum throttle. It's the same system here with the turbine and the ECU. So there is a calibration process. Now, I was a bit daunted about doing that by myself, but I read the JetCat manual, and it's literally a couple of paragraphs as, as to what you need to do. And if you go step by step, it is really, really easy. And I had no problem. So you're setting things like your start sequence and uh, that kind of thing. And we'll talk about that a bit later about the start sequence because it's another thing that I learned. Now the fuel system is another critical part in a turbine. And the main thing is you've got to keep the fuel flow up. You can't have air bubbles going into that turbine because it's going to shut down. So it is sensitive to fuel going in. In this instance, we're using Jet A1 kerosene to power this motor. I think you can run it on diesel, but I'm probably going to stick with the, the kerosene, the Jet A1. Uh, system. So what we have inside the plane here, and you'll see in most turbines, is a, a, an air trap, basically. So it's almost like a tank before the tank, or a tank after the tank. It's a tank after the tank. So in this model, there are two tanks uh, made out of Kevlar, and uh, 
they feed into the air trap. Now the air trap is basically a bowl of fluid that remains full so that air can't get in. And so that is then connected to the turbine. So we're going tank, air trap, into turbine. By having that smaller air trap, you always got this constant feed of fuel. It will always be full. Now, if you run out of petrol, yeah, the engine's gonna cut. That's where we have to set your timers and make sure you fly within your limits. But that air trap will always be full, trapping any air out. So the turbine will always be fed just pure jet A1 and no air in the mix. Now you probably noticed this jet, it, it's pretty messy inside. I haven't done a lot of work to clean it up. As I said, I bought it this way um, and just haven't got round to uh, cleaning up all the cabling. But what you'll notice is there's a lot of air lines and there's a lot of uh, fuel lines going around. Now the fuel lines we sort of get. Now, one thing I wanna mention about fuel lines is the fittings, because we don't normally see the fittings that in uh, normal gas planes, they're all uh, Festo clicking kind of uh, connectors, which I was a bit daunted at because I've never used them before, but they're absolutely awesome. They're a really, really tight, uh, secure way of connecting up uh, all the tubing. I can't remember what the diameter of this tube is that I'm using, because remember, I didn't build this model, so uh, 4.2.5, oh, I don't know what it is. Anyway, uh, so the fuel line's using all these uh, Festo's type of fittings where the uh, the tubing just plugs in. Now, the air lines. Now, why do we have air lines in this plane? That's because we use air to manage the retracts and the gear doors. So, retractable undercarriage. And yes, we've moved a lot to electric, and I think electric is a great way to go for your, uh, your retracts and even your gear doors, because uh, uh, just for reliability, really, but that's why I think we're seeing a lot of people move to electricity and, and sort of the simplicity of it as well. But this system has an air retract system, and to be honest, I've done a lot of testing with it, and it's been phenomenal. I haven't had any problems with the air system. As I said, the air system's managing retracts and doors. Now, over here, we have the air controllers that control the doors and the retracts, and one other aspect, the brakes. There are actually brakes on the main wheels that are also air driven. So there's three controllers here for uh, gear, gear doors and brakes. Now these controls are critical in the whole air system because they are almost like they're electronic and they tell the system, or they actuate the air systems for the different uh, components being retracts, brakes or gear doors. So each one of these modules is connected to the receiver. In this instance, uh, I am managing everything through my transmitter as far as the sequencing. So as you can imagine, the gear doors need to open first, then the retracts come down uh, and in reverse as well. So all that sequencing, so when the people refer to sequencing, that's what we're talking about. What has to happen first and what happens last? And in this instance, gear doors down, retracts down, retract up, gear doors up. That has all been managed within my Spectrum DX18 transmitter. Now, if you don't have that functionality in the transmitter, you can buy a separate sequencers. This plane actually came with a separate sequencer, which allows you, it's got some dials to dial in what happens first. These modules connect to the receiver to trigger the air actuation. Each module has two air lines going in and out, except for the brakes. The brakes have one air line going into them, but the gear doors and the retracts have an in and out uh, airflow. What happens with that in and out airflow is that you do end up using the air. The air is used up to drive the, 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 the retract. So what happens is you need to pump up the system up. You need to fill, there's a couple of cans down the back here that look like aerosol cans that store the compressed air to drive the systems, like a hydraulic system in a kind of way. So in the middle of the plane here, we have this little device from Interco. So on top, we've got two dials, one for gear, one for brakes, and that's to um, measure the, basically the, the pressure of the air in the cans, in the system. And it's always important that before every flight, you pump them up. You're pumping up the gears and the brakes uh, primarily. And the retracts all works with that with the gear system as well. So there's two valves to pump up the two cans that are sitting out the back. Uh, what I find is that the brakes last a fair while. So the can that manages the brakes, you can get multiple presses of the brakes, you know, over numerous flights. Uh, but with the retracts, you probably get safely three up and down movements in a flight uh, before it starts to die out, uh, which is not great. So really what you want to do with the jet is 
retract the retracts and then push them down once and then you'll be uh, well within your, your, your safe limits. But very, very critical before every flight, you should pump up those cans. Do not get lazy. What I've done with my Spectrum DX18 is when I turn my radio on and I've got it set to this model, there's actually a pre-flight check. And one of the pre-flight checks is to make sure that there's a fuel valve here that you must have uh, that must be set to the right position to allow the fuel flow. So uh, here in Australia, you have, there is a requirement for turbine jets. There is a secondary cutoff to shut down the turbine. And in this instance, it's a fuel tap. Uh, so I've got a pre-flight test that says the fuel tap needs to be uh, in the correct position, that my air compressors, my tanks have been full to remind me of what I need to do. And there's a few other little checks there that I wanna make before I actually fly the model because I don't wanna lose this model due to some stupid error that I've made and rushing, but always pump up those tanks. And when it comes to the electronic systems in this plane, it's very similar to everything else that you've probably built when it comes to RC models. Uh, I'm using the Spectrum system and I'm using uh, what they call a power safe receiver, which is, it's, it's, a, it's a device that allows me to have two batteries connected uh, to the receiver to power the receiver system. And in this case, I'm using uh, two life packs from uh, Boomer RC here in Australia. And they give me a redundant electric system. So what that means is if one battery fails, there's another battery. And, and I do that for any model above 30cc. I always like to have two batteries in my aircraft. Now, some people say, oh, but it's extra weight. We just need two smaller batteries because what ends up happening with these systems is though you've got two batteries, they draw from one battery at a time and they sort of alternate. So they're both dropping at a similar value. I've got a great habit of checking my batteries after every second flight at least. With the jet, I'll probably check it after every flight to make sure the batteries are okay, charge them up if I need to. Uh, but uh, having those two batteries and that redundant system is really, really great. Now, the other good thing about these power safe receivers is when it comes to amp draw. Now, amp draw is how much power is being pulled from those batteries by all the electronics. And what you find in some larger aircraft, the amp draw can get a bit higher. The more servos you've got, the higher the amp draw. Now that power safe, I think can do something like uh, handle 30 amps or something like that. It's got uh, 12 channels, this receiver. And I've, for the first time ever, I've used every single channel. Because when you think about it, not only have I got two servos for elevator, one for rudder, two flap servos, two aileron servos, a nose wheel servo. I've also got the connection to the ECU for throttle, and then I've got the three uh, um, air modules, so the brakes, the gears, uh, brakes, gear doors, and retracts. And I've also got one uh, another uh, plug-in for a telemetry system, which keeps on ungluing my telemetry module. So what I've done is I've got the JetCat module, uh, telemetry module from Spectrum, and this is an older PowerSafe receiver, mind you. The new PowerSafe receivers have got built-in telemetry where you just plug the telemetry module into the, the receiver. So I'm using a, a secondary module from an older system, TM1000 it is, uh, system. But I've got the JetCat uh, module plugged into the data port of the ECU over here. And what that means is that I'm getting telemetry back to my radio, which is really handy at the startup phase that I can look at that and see what RPM am I at, is it stable, and it's giving me feedback. And then I can also set up alarms against that if there's problems with the system so I know to come into land or shut down the turbine or whatever. So that's just a handy safeguard that I've added to the system, which is not necessary, but uh, what it does mean is that I've used up every single channel in the receiver. Now there's one other aspect that I could add that we see a lot of uh, jet people do, is, which is add a gyro. And what that gyro will do is just, it's basically a safeguard system, I think. Now with this kind of plane, I've flown a lot of aerobatic planes and I'm confident that I can fly this plane without a gyro system in it. But what it will do is just a safety net. And I've considered doing that, but the biggest problem I've got is that I've run out of channels on my receiver. I need one more channel to be able to do that. Now I could do things like put a Y lead in or something on the flaps, but I'm a stickler for having separate uh, um, connections for each servo. So at this point in time, I'm gonna fly it without a gyro and we'll see how we go. So here's a little recap. We have turbine. Turbine connects to the fuel tanks via the air trap. So turbine, air trap, tanks, ECU, ECU is connected to the pump, the, if the fuel pump. ECU is connected to the receiver for throttle. In my instance, I've got ECU also connected to telemetry. Uh, then I have the air systems running the 
the two cans out the back full of air, the three modules managing doors, retracts and brakes. I've got that little plate that gives me all the information, the valves to pump up the air system so I know how much air I've got in my lines. Uh, it's also good just on that point, which I should have mentioned earlier, you must test all this before you fly. Make sure that you do a leak test of all your air systems. Pump the system up and just observe whether the, the PSI is dropping if there's any leaks. Unfortunately, this has been rock solid. I can't find a leak anywhere. Then we've got our receiver connected to all of our servos in the airplane for our normal traditional controls. And then we've got two batteries driving that receiver in that redundant uh, system, which is always what I recommend in these bigger planes, especially in the turbine. And then up front, we will have a life battery pack driving the ECU. So what have I learned as a result of getting into turbines and, and playing around with this model? It's actually really, really simple. It is. I was extremely daunted and I thought, oh, I just can't get my head around it. And I, I was having a chat with a friend, a really experienced modeler, and he hasn't gone into jets because he just says, I just don't understand it. But hopefully this video helps in that understanding, but it's really, really simple. Turbines are so basic to put into the aeroplane. They're so basic to connect, you know, with just that ECU managing everything. Yes, you've got to calibrate the throttle and, and set up the, the start sequence, but that's simple. The, the, the starting sequence in these models is really just assigning some switches. So in my instance, I've got a startup sequence on a slider and there's, it's like a, a safeguard kind of system that you, I push up a slider uh, on the side of my transmitter, I move my throttle stick to full throttle and that engages and tells the ECU to start the motor. What will happen is we'll go through a startup process, rev up to 35,000 revs or something like that uh, and then the, the turbine will ignite so it spins up on the electric motor first. Uh, fuel pump starts pumping fuel in and it ignites and the turbine's on, drop the throttle down to zero, I'm ready to go flying and that's it. To turn it off, well, just grab that slider, drop it down and the, the, it will start the shutdown sequence. So it's a pretty easy, easy thing, not hard at all. If you have to build one from scratch, there's some great build videos out there, but again, there's not much to do. You've got to connect the lines and all that kind of stuff. But when you have all those components laid out on your table, it will just click pretty quickly. And that's what it did for me. Well, I hope this video has helped you. If you're looking at getting to uh, turbine jets like I just have, I actually haven't flown this plane yet. So I'm telling you, I'm a complete novice with uh, jets. It's coming, we've been in lockdown here because of the whole COVID situation, which has prevented me from flying the model. But as soon as I can, I will be getting this model out. It is ready to go, all set up, put all my radio gear in, tested it all, everything is working. So simple, simple thing to do. Can't wait to get out and have fun with my Skymaster Viper Jet, the two meter version, if you're wondering. Uh, if you've got any questions, just put them below. And don't forget, if you like this video, Take a look at some of the other flat out RC videos. We want to do more videos, there's more coming. Uh, we want to get out flying, just can't get flying at the moment, but more videos are on their way. So, turbine jets, get into them. It's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs>